Thank you so much for tuning in today to Our Future, the Green Stimulus and Indigenous Leadership with Congresswoman Deb Holland, Mark Ruffalo, and Tokata Iron Eyes. Our panel discussion on the need for a green job stimulus and increasing support for Native communities. I'm Michaela Shavaco. I'm a program coordinator at New Yorkers for Clean Power, which is a statewide campaign that works on the transition off of fossil fuels and onto renewable energy, energy efficiency, and clean transportation. We organized this panel in partnership with We Stand United with Mark Ruffalo and Julia Walsh. Um, as many of you may know, the government has passed a series of stimulus bills as a part of the emergency response to the coronavirus crisis, which has taken tens of thousands of lives and has sent our country into a free fall in economy. Um, like with any devastating crisis, there will be opportunity to rebuild in the direction of progress. We can start that progress right now with these stimulus bills. We need to call on our representatives not to invest one more penny in the fossil fuel industry and to fund the solutions and begin building a sustainable society. We've organized a petition to call on Congress to include funding and investment in green infrastructure, clean jobs, and clean energy industries for future stimulus bills. I'm joined today by three inspiring climate activists and leaders to discuss the connection between the coronavirus crisis, the climate crisis, the need for a green stimulus, and how frontline communities like those in native communities are affected and can be supported. From New Mexico, I'd like to welcome Congresswoman Deb Holland. She and Congresswoman Sharice Davids were the first two Native American women to be elected to Congress. She has worked tirelessly to protect tribal sovereignty and advocate for Native communities and recent stimuluses. From New York, I'm welcoming climate activist and actor Mark Ruffalo, who worked on the anti-fracking campaign in New York to ban fracked gas and advocate for a transition to 100% renewable energy. He has also been a consistent ally to Native communities. And I'd also like to welcome 16-year-old Indigenous youth activist activist Tokata Iron Eyes, who is enrolled, an enrolled member in the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. Tokata has been on the front lines for a more sustainable world at the age of nine and was instrumental in starting the call out for people to come to Standing Rock and stop the Dakota Access Pipeline. I'm really excited and honored to have all of you on the panel today as such powerful leaders in the climate movement, celebrating Earth Week, with me and everyone that's tuning in. Um, so thank you so much for everyone that's joining. And I'd like to start it off with Congresswoman Holland. Thank you for joining us and all the work you do in Congress and your community to push back against the fossil fuel industry and ad advocate for those on the front lines of this climate crisis. Um, I was wondering if you could explain to our viewers what a stimulus is and what is going on in Congress right now with that. Sure, thank you, Michaela. I'm so honored to, to join this uh, panel of amazing human beings who care deeply about our environment and uh, I, I'm just in the best company right now. So happy Earth Day, happy Earth Week. Uh, every day should be Earth Day because we should always uh, be thinking about how we can tread more lightly on this earth so that uh, future generations have an opportunity to have what our grandparents have. Um, uh, Michaela, uh, the st stimulus is legislation with spending and policies designed to help spur the economy and help the communities deal with the loss of jobs. And that's exactly what's happening right now during this COVID-19 crisis. And any stimulus should help everyone. It should help all people, regardless of race, immigration status, gender, uh, anything. It should just be there for everybody and definitely not for the richest folks in our country. Um, the bill we're voting on today is an interim fix to, uh, to, uh, to what we'd like to continue to have, which is uh, more relief for more people for working people and not just uh, the top few. 
Um, the, next care act, the next CARES Act that we intend to work hard on uh, will be an opportunity for us to invest in the Green New Deal in environmental issues and, and climate change, addressing climate change. Okay, awesome. And I understand in the last stimulus, Native communities were originally given nothing and that you and your colleagues were able to fight to get $8 billion. Um, can you tell us uh, what the importance of funds that were allocated to Native communities? So uh, we started out by advocating for $20 billion for tribes. The White House came back with zero. Uh, we said 15, the White House said three. Uh, we got all our colleagues to uh, get on the phone and advocate uh, you know, for tribes. Uh, we, we ended up with eight. So look, the eight billion needs to go to tribes. There's 574 federally recognized tribes in our country. Uh, they know how best to spend funding with the emergency that they are having. Tribes are different. Uh, their land bases are different. Their number of members are different. Their health care is different. So, um, but I, what I want to say real quick is that um, eight billion, it's fine. 20 would be better, but also tribes are starting from uh, a place that, that has been underfunded for decades and decades. Yes, I'm uh, the federal government has a trust responsibility to tribes. Uh, that includes health care for all members of tribal nations. And, um, you know, they just, the Indian Health Service has been underfunded for such a long time. And then you add a stimulus, uh, I'm sorry, a, a, a a COVID-19 pandemic on top of it, it makes things much harder. So, um, so the tribes need this money to, to implement their emergency uh, services to make sure that people are getting the health care and the testing that they need. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and can you also share with us what you hope for the next stimulus, both for Indian country and a green stimulus? Absolutely. So, of course, um, I'm always going to advocate for tribes every chance I get. And um, I'll just quickly say that um, down the road, we, we will introduce a bill called Honoring Promises to Native Nations Act. That's a bill, a legislative package that Elizabeth Warren and I are working on. Uh, because, as I mentioned, tribes have been underfunded in many areas. So, uh, so that is, uh, once we get back uh, to normal, uh, that's something that we're going to continue to work on. Uh, but look, uh, I'd love to include some of some of the bills that I have in the next uh, package. I have a zero waste bill, and that uh, helps local entities to transition to zero waste. Uh, we have the 100% Clean Economy Act that would transition to a clean economy by 2015. Uh, we have the 30 by 30 to preserve uh, 30 percent of our land and oceans by 2030. We need to, I'm the vice chair of the Natural Resources Committee and it's, it's just so evident that our public lands are inundated with gas and oil extraction. Um, our public lands give off 25 percent of carbon emissions in our country so I'm always working no matter where uh, to, to, to make that decline uh, that is unreasonable to have 25% of carbon emissions coming from our public lands. That's because there's not enough uh, green energy projects in far too many um, oil extraction projects. So we're always wor working to make sure that we can protect our public lands uh, for, uh, for people who deserve to enjoy our public lands. And, um, and so, yes, we, uh, you know, when I think about how this pandemic has affected um, some communities more than others, it's the communities who have underlying health problems uh, that, that they haven't been able to care for. It's people who haven't had health care or who live in polluted areas or who don't have running water or electricity or broadband internet service where they can connect to the world. We, those are all things that we need to uh, work on. And um, in fact, one of the pieces I'd like to get in the next bill is an emergency broadband internet uh, piece so that um, 
folks can have access to telemedicine and kids can have access to their teachers. So um, those are all things that we'll work on. Great. Well, thank you so much, Congresswoman Holland, for everything that you're doing to push these initiatives forward. Um, it's incredible to have leaders like you in our government. Um, and so now I'd like to pass it off to Mark Ruffalo. Uh, Mark, you've been both an incredible actor and activist. Can you share with us how you got into this fight for a clean energy future and what gives you hope in this moment? Um, I got into this uh, when I moved to upstate New York in the middle of um, the Gaslands uh, and the fracking boom. And um, basically uh, saw in real time how devastating that tech, that uh, industry was um, to communities and to the land and to the air and to the water. Um, and uh, we worked hard in New York State and finally um, we got Governor Cuomo to ban, ban it. Um, we, how we did that was to show him also, uh, as you know so well, was to show him um, that there was another future that was possible for the state that, that um, would create so many more jobs that would, would keep our energy dollars in state instead of sending them elsewhere and, um, and, and, would, keep, and, and would mitigate against any, um, any kind of um, pollution that the fossil fuel industry brings with it. And uh, after building a compendium of scientific evidence that uh, was over um, 1,500 pages, uh, all showing the, the, that fracking was also a, um, a public health concern, he, uh, he banned fracking in New York State and just codified it uh, last month. And, um, and has now moved the state to 100% renewable energy. Um, and it was by the determination of so many different grassroots people that this came to be. And it's probably one of the biggest environmental wins we've seen in the United States in the last uh, 30 years. So that's how I came to it. What gives me hope is, um, is that this technology is ready to go today um, the, we're seeing the fossil fuel industry is, is collapsing under its own weight. Um, and, um, and we have the stimulus uh, uh, ready to go that will create um, so many more jobs, uh, 5 million more jobs than we'll lose um, to make this transition. And um, I just, I just, I, I'm very, I feel like this is the right time. COVID is exposing all of um, our weaknesses in our economic and, and health and political and environmental systems. And um, so out of this tragedy, I think is a, is a great uh, opportunity arising. And uh, these stimulus packages are a way to create jobs in this country, but people are gonna need, we're, we're gonna hit the biggest recession we've seen probably since the 30s. And, um, and we need a jobs program. And this is the way to do it. Th these are the last markets that haven't been tapped. There's 500 million homes that are ready for solar today. That's a market that's waiting to be tapped. Um, for every million dollars uh, of spending from the government, we only get five fossil fuel jobs compared to 22 retrofitting efficiency jobs and 14 and 15 jobs in solar and wind. So this is the way to go. It's the most efficient way. And, I, and I'm, I'm very hopeful for, um, for the opportunities this is creating. Yeah, definitely. And uh, you made some really great points about uh, New York leading the way um, and showing that we can beat the fossil fuel industry and that now more than ever, we definitely need funding for green jobs. Um, and a lot of the points that uh, you laid out, we do cover in this petition that we made up calling on Congress for a green job stimulus. Um, so we hope that many of the people tuning in today will be able to sign that. You can go, go to nyforcleanpower.org and click the button to sign and send a message to Congress that we need a green job stimulus immediately um, in order to get us out of all of the crises that we're facing. Um, and so now I'd like to pass it to Tokata Iron Eyes, um, who I just found out yesterday. Her name, Tokata, 
um, means future. So um, thanks so much to Kata for joining us and I'm excited to be a part of the sustainable future that you're gonna help lead us into. Uh, many of our viewers are activists and getting involved for the first time. Um, so can you tell us about how you became an activist and um, a little bit about the movement to stop the Dakota Access Pipeline at Standing Rock? Yeah, so um, Standing Rock happened in 2016 and I was 12 years old when and I was a part of the very first media campaign surrounding the issue of the Dakota Access Pipeline and what it meant for communities like Standing Rock when the oil industry comes in to exploit our lands and our resources. And um, so at that age, I kind of didn't have really a scope of sort of these huge industries and different issues that I was facing. Um, I didn't understand that they affected the entire world. I, I just knew the history that, um, the history of violence that had occurred between the US government and between my people for millennia. And, you know, we're just, and so at that age, it was, it was just like, I, I just knew I needed clean water. And, um, a lot of my activism, I can say now, came from a place of necessity. Um, and so that's kind of how I started. I just realized, like, there's no other people, there's, like, it felt like there was no other people in the world that had to um, beg for the right to clean water, beg for a safe home to have. Um, and I realized that my family and my people have spent generations doing that. Um, and... So I decided to do something about it um, using social media. And social media has been, was, and it was a pivotal part of what Standing Rock became because it provided so much communication. As you can see now during COVID, I think we're all seeing that social media is one of the hugest parts of any of our lives and being able to use it um, for good and use it to communicate good messages and do good work. Um, is what needs to happen. And um, yeah, so that's when I started. I started public speaking when I was nine and it was, it, it was because my parents had been activists and I mean, my entire life and just raised me to be in tune sort of with my place in the world and what it means to be a human on this earth and uh, how I'm supposed to hold myself and respect my relationship with the things around me um and so I I grew up thinking and knowing it was a part of everything around me that I had to protect it I had an obligation to protect it I, um so yeah that's how I got started um mm -hmm. and now I'm living on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota um, where we're facing issues like the Keystone XL pipeline. Um, and yeah, recently, uh, actually, they tried to expand the Dakota Access Pipeline, which is now pumping a million gallons or, or 500,000 barrels of oil a day. Um, and they tried to double the capacity so that the pipeline was processing about a million barrels a day after it had already, um, after several pipelines around the area had already leaked. Um, and so we just see that America has a huge history of not paying attention to the mistakes it's making, not learning from bad decisions that we've made in the past. And we're at a point right now where that's not acceptable anymore um, because lives are being lost. And not that they, and, and like um, Mark, said this is just highlighting all of the other issues that have been going on um, for a really long time that have gone unnoticed that our minority populations have been suffering for a really long time um, and it's bringing all of that to the forefront it's showing the rest of um, of the privileged U.S. It's, it's showing people who have never had to worry before. It's showing them that the sort of state of emergency that a lot of marginalized people are feeling every moment of every day because it's a sort of desperation when you realize that without your basic needs met, your family cannot survive, your home cannot be upheld. 
and and so we're just coming to this sort of pivotal moment where I think we're finally realizing that enough is enough. I mean, it's only because now it's affecting everyone in everyone's home. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, you couldn't have said it better. Um, and I know that you are in this because out of necessity, but your leadership is um, inspiring and um so honored to have you with us talking about your experiences and um, putting these important issues to the forefront. Um, and so uh, we have a final question with our remaining few minutes. Um, so the Navajo Nation is the third biggest hotspot for COVID-19. Um, Mark, would you uh, share with us your experience with the Navajo Nation right now? Um, yeah, would you um, be able to share your experience about that? Um, yeah, we, uh, we started, uh, I, I was asked to help out, um, get the word out to the youth with um, Protect the Sacred, which was started by um, Allie Young and uh, Wahela Johns, who are both um, Navajo uh, residents and um, and that that sort of we started speaking to the youth and created a, um, a hero sort of uh, contest for them to help the grandparents to uh, create a um, uh, an essentials runner and to um, make sure the the, the elders um, were were safe were, were, were because safe, of their were knowledge. Safe. Uh, they're the knowledge, uh, they're the knowledge keepers. keepers. And so, um, and so I'm, uh, getting a, I'm getting a, uh, an echo. An echo. Is there? I'm sorry. That's, I, can't, I can't concentrate. I'm already ADHD. Um, and, uh, and, and that's turned into, uh, you know, an, another wonderful development where um, we reached out to Governor Cuomo and, um, and now Governor Cuomo and President Nez are talking and they're gonna create a, uh, a state um, reservation pact of, um, of help. Uh, yeah, Governor Cuomo is gonna include the Navajo Nation in this state pooling of, um, of PPE and uh, medical equipment. And I think it's historical. I'm not sure anything like that's ever been done. And, it, and, it, and it's also another sign of um, that, that I, what I call the, the Native American century, uh, that, that this rising of our Native people and this acknowledgement of them as the first peoples of this country and of their technology and their contributions to our culture and their contributions to the future with their, with their knowledge of, um, and relationship to, to the planet and creator and mother, mother earth. Um, but what I'm seeing is just an enormous amount of resilience, but what they need, they need, they need the same thing everyone else needs in, in our country. And uh, for some reason, um, they're not asking for a hand out, they're asking for a leg up. Um, and, uh, and people are coming from all over the United States to, um, to assist and, and to acknowledge that they are Americans, that they, they have to be treated and respected with the same dignity as Americans. And, um, and what's most remarkable about them is their resilience, their, their ability to adapt. Uh, the worst in American history has happened to them. And they're still here, they're surviving. And that's what I learned from uh, Takata and her family, what I learned from our brothers and sisters in Standing Rock, what, what I was told when things were at the darkest, darkest moment where a military, American military mass was there with w weapons of war to stand against a peaceful demonstration to stop the poisoning of a community's water. And it was, it was frightening. And, uh, and what, I, what I learned from them was that, listen, Brother Mark, this is bad, but we've been here before and we'll survive. And, um, and it's with that same resilience and that same spirit that they'll, they'll overcome COVID. But there's a lot of work to do. And uh, if anyone's listening, we're, we're calling on uh, medical volunteers to, to, come, to come there now. What they need most of all is PPE and medical volunteers. Um, and you can get that information at protectthesacred.com of how to, uh, how to help out with PPE uh, donations and, um, and uh, medical volunteers. Mika Michaela, if I could just say real quick, this yes. is Deb again. Um, thank you, Mark. Thank you for your commitment. Um, you, 
you um, have done so much for Indian country by ra you know raising us up, raising our profiles up. We need you know we need folks with name recognition to, to be talking about these things because you know they don't they don't listen to a lot of people. Uh, but I just wanted to quickly say that um, just to kind of get put a, a shine a spotlight on um, the discrepancies in 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 healthcare, I guess you could say, um, uh, and the fact that tribes essentially, you know, they start from behind everyone else. Um, in New Mexico, uh, we Native Americans are 11% of the population and 40% of the positive COVID cases. And so, um, you know, it's what I highlighted earlier is that we're behind in funding for healthcare and education and housing and everything else. Yeah, right. that's what I'm seeing there too. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you, you just see that they're dying at rates than any other uh, group in America now. And it's, and it's the same thing, you know, it's, it's, it's a discrimination. It's, it's somehow these people are less American than everyone else, or that somehow all men aren't created equally in the, in the eyes of this nation. And, and, and that's what we're asked. That's what we have to finish and stop. And that's what they're dealing with right now. They're not yeah, being I treated the same way. Oh, go ahead. I think, uh, sorry. I think another like really important thing to say is like, we have a really high population population of elders and these aren't just people who we recognize as grandmothers and grandfathers but they are carriers of our nations <clears throat> they hold all of our history and our ceremonies our songs our stories these things that we've been able to carry with us in our resiliency um and in, in order to keep that strength and in order to keep ourselves sustained um and to to identify ourselves as indigenous peoples and as Lakota, uh, and to be able to recognize our history, we need those people to be able to pass those stories on. Um, and and right now, you know, it's it's a really scary time because Native nations, as um, Congresswoman said, uh, you know, we we've been dealing with all of this for a really long time, and it's put us behind a lot of other people. Um, in this sort of race, you know, to get handouts from <laughs> not not even handouts, just our, our basic needs met. We've been going without it for so long that it has caused a uh, huge consequences in our community. Um, without our, our food sovereignty, you know, we've had a diet that doesn't support health. We we live in in such a way that um, our health was never at a level that. Um, you know, would, in, would, would tell us that we could um, survive wholeheartedly throughout something like this. And, and it's just, um, it, it's just really, it's at a point now where people, uh, and not people, but it seems that when push comes to shove, you know, we're the first ones to fall. Yeah. Um. Well, thank you so much, Tokata and Mark and Congresswoman Holland. And thank you to the youth movement and Native Americans doing a lot of the frontline work on climate action around the world. Um, we want to thank everyone for joining Earth Day Live and to remember to please sign our petition for a green stimulus on our website at NY for Clean Power. Hour.org. We're building a movement for a better future together. Um, so happy Earth Day, everyone. And thank you again to our incredible speakers and leaders. Um, we're so happy that we are all in this together and we can move forward for a better world. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Earth yeah. Day. Happy Earth thank Day. Thank you. Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Week.